Let's start off with business and immigration law updates. This segment is a presentation of the Karana Law Firm located in Rockville, Maryland. The chief attorney and counselor at law there is attorney Ramesh Karana. Today's segment will be moderated by attorney Kenneth Haber from the law office of Kenneth Joel Haber, located also in Maryland. Together, these two attorneys are found in a conversation on some practical pointers as well as strategies in defending against marriage fraud. Let's take a look. Welcome to the Capital Forum. I'm Kenneth Haber. I'm a healthcare attorney and the moderator of this uh, segment of Capital, the Capital Forum. Uh, with me is uh, Ramesh Karana. He's a immigration attorney with an international client base that uh, uh, spans the world, literally. Uh, he's here to uh, provide us some information concerning various aspects of, inter of uh, immigration law. Welcome, Ramesh. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions concerning uh, practical strategies and pointers concerning uh, defending uh, against uh, accusations of marriage fraud. Uh, uh, are you ready for that? Oh, yes. Very good. I would so certainly suspect you would be because of the fact that you have such a wide client base. Uh, can you first tell us what kind of evidence can be submitted uh, uh, for the Green Guard application to immigration when the uh, newly uh, married couple lacks traditional evidence of good faith marriage? Uh, can uh, I think this is a very pertinent question in today's situation because the speed at which USCIS is processing I-130 and adjustment of status application, that is really a welcome step. What we are seeing in our practice is that when we file the package, when the people get married, we file I-130, 485, I-765. These applications are for the purpose of grant of, uh, 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 first of all, green card, and then this would include the employment authorization card, and this includes what we call is the adjustment of status application. And uh, I see in my practice that interview comes in three to four months, which is really a welcome step. So what happens? Now, the downside is that we are not able to create the traditional evidence in the form of commingling of assets of husband and wife. Because we need to provide an evidence that this is husband and wife, they live together and they have commingled their uh, assets. So we need to think in a very creative way. We, we can provide affidavits from friends and relatives and we can also provide you know, uh, membership for the gym and like that. And maybe that person has been added already to the lease, but it may be very hard to provide any, any evidence like these two people are having their joint accounts or they have filed their joint tax returns because if the person is getting married with the foreign national sometimes in April or May and tax return for the previous year is already filed. So that, that becomes a strong evidence, but this is missing. So we have to be very creative, very creative. How does uh, immigration interpret uh, marriage as fraudulent or sham at the inception? This is a very interesting question. Now, the relevant inquiry goes right to the beginning of the marriage, whether these two people decided to get married to impart immigration benefit to the foreign national right from the beginning. If that was the intent, then it it is termed as a sham marriage or a fraudulent marriage because the sole purpose of the marriage was just to seek an immigration benefit for the foreign national. They never intended to get married in the first place. So that is why this marriage becomes a sham marriage right from the beginning and which will not be liked by the USCIS. What are some of the red flags that are commonly known in relationship to marriage fraud that would typically raise suspicion of an immigration officer? I'm glad, uh, uh, Ken, you are using the term red flags. And uh, these red flags are sometimes very obvious and we cannot ignore them. Let us say 
husband and wife they are getting married and difference in the age is 20 years. Husband is uh, older by 20 years than the wife. This becomes a red flag. And similarly, if two people speak different languages and these two people cannot communicate with each other. One person just speaks Spanish or Hindi and other person does not speak Spanish or Hindi at all. Other person just talks in English. So, how these two people are going to communicate? Then third red flag I always call is that they are coming from a different ethnic background. And sometimes what happens is that a person because of some problem with the immigration status, now that person is put in removal proceedings like this is called the deportation and that person receives what we call is notice to appear before the immigration judge and as soon as it happens that person tries to get married because the person does not want to go out of the US. So, that is also a red flag. So, similarly we can think about uh, education level. One person is holding a PhD degree, other person is just a high school graduate. How these people intellectual levels are the same? So, that also becomes a red flag. Let us say economic situation and uh, job situation. One person is the CEO of a company and other person is just working as a uh, I would say a front person in a store. So, that, that becomes a red flag too. I imagine that they have developed a lot of red flags. Uh, how would uh, they distinguish a fraudulent marriage uh, versus a non-viable one where the couple is just not getting along? Right. Uh, can we discuss about the fraudulent or sham marriage? Uh, I think this was in response to your first question, which basically marriage was intended just to take the immigration benefit. That is a fraudulent marriage and uh, non viable is one which, uh, which would uh, show that uh, these two people are not getting along well. So, they can say that there are irreconcilable differences or incompatibilities there, but that does not mean that that marriage is a fraudulent one. Now, sometimes I have seen in my practice that people get separated immediately after marriage within 6 months that does not mean that marriage was not bona fide in the first place. So, we have to show that marriage was intended to be a bona fide marriage right from the beginning, but as they were walking along the way and they probably they did not like their habits or they did not uh, uh, just understand each other or they came from the different ethnic backgrounds and they decided to live separately. So, that becomes an unviable marriage, but unviable marriage will not stop the person from getting the green card. Now, that is very clear and this has been supported by a case law by the court. So, there is enough evidence to provide for that. I imagine that an unviable marriage that could easily be seen as legitimate is if somebody gets pregnant with uh, the mate's child. You are 100 percent right. In fact, it happened with me when I was representing somebody in interview before the USCIS office and uh, I asked that lady, please bring in this issue because you are pregnant and I advised that lady to bring a picture, uh, you know, which is usually taken by the doctors uh, as a result of we, we call it sonogram. So, she was carrying 2-3 pictures at different stages after 3 months, after 4 months, after 5 months Then I say take the doctor's prescription. And we made copies of these pictures and doctor substitution. Oh, I am pregnant. So, that, that is an evidence which the USCIS would like to see. And officer was very happy to see that. Made the decision much easier, I would imagine, without it. Yes, you know, and officer was happy and she said, I have absolutely no doubt about the bona fide of this marriage and I am inclined to approve the green card petition. So, it all depends upon the situation. Yes, yes. Uh, they have to use common sense when they are making these decisions. You are 100 percent right, you know. Of course, the officer when interviewing you, he would like to look into your eyes and it is all a matter of credibility whether they are really married or not. They will ask them, what did you eat last night? They will ask the husband, then they will separately ask the same question from the wife. What kind of car do you have? And if some inconsistencies are found, that case is gone forever. 
what are some of the strategies in responding to a notice of intent of denial, uh, alleging a marriage uh, fraud? Uh, how do you deal with such situations? Now, that's a very unfortunate situation, Ken, when it happens. When a notice of intent to deny, which we call in our immigration language as NOID, if this is received by the client, I mean, he is going to be in a very difficult situation because uh, USCIS has already determined that this marriage is not a bona fide or legitimate marriage. And the list of various factors, we were talking about inconsistencies in response to your previous question. So they will list all those issues. We interviewed husband, this is what husband said, this is what wife said. So they will give five ten examples of those inconsistencies and it becomes a very difficult situation to respond to it because most of the times it would happen when a client has not engaged the services of an immigration lawyer at that point of time because legal support was not there and case could not be presented properly. So again, we have to be very creative in that kind of situation. We have to provide the best possible physical evidence to support that this is a legitimate and bona fide marriage and parties wanted to get married in the first place in good faith and this is a bona fide marriage. We will emphasize again on commingling of assets like which probably if these were not taken care of previously, we can take care of now. Of course, the question mark would be that this commingling has taken place now, but it's still better and it does help in uh, overcoming the issue of uh, notice of intent to deny. What do you uh, tell your clients uh, before that, uh, from the beginning, in order to avoid that type of problem? Yeah, if the client uh, comes to me before filing the application, then I am going to provide all physical evidence about the commingling of assets. And then of course, first of all, my question is, is it a real marriage? If it is not a real marriage, I will refuse to represent that couple. I will say, sorry, I can't do it because I am bound by my own ethical responsibility. If I understand it's a legitimate question, then it should not be a problem to document uh, all the requirements. What are the criteria for H-1B uh, petition for professionals? Maybe, can uh, I think uh, we are short of time. At this point, he is indicating time is over. Maybe we can discuss in the next segment. Very good. Thank you very much for being on the Capital Forum. Thank you very much, Ken. I appreciate you inviting me here in the studios. It's my pleasure. Thank you.